Excellent. Thank you very much for your patience uh, while we resolve that uh, technical issue. But it's been resolved, so we can, um, we can begin. Uh, I'm really pleased to see all of you here. Thanks for coming. Uh, and this is a, a topic that really I, I, have, I have passionate interest in, um, in no small part because I had the good fortune when I was uh, a graduate student at the Divinity School, the University of Chicago, to study with um, one of the truly great scholars of Christian mysticism, Bernard McGinn. Uh, I happened to be in class with him. Uh, this would have been in, uh, must have been 1995, 1996. And uh, he was right at the beginning of publishing his monumental Presence of God series. This is a, I think there are seven, there might even be eight volumes in the series, which is his, his encyclopedic survey of, of Christian mysticism, Western Christian mysticism. And I learned so much from that, from that, uh, that course. I learned so much from the experience of, of, of listening to him lecture. He extemporized the lectures because the, he had internalized the material so, uh, so profoundly that he, he just could talk about it in this way that was incredibly captivating. And what I didn't realize at the time, but has subsequently informed my spiritual life, my creative life, is I was being introduced to the material for a lifetime, a lifetime's worth of, of study, contemplation, activation. So I feel really, I feel really connected to this material, and I'm. I'm really happy to be able to present it to you. Um, and I hope that I present it in a way that's, uh, that's appealing. Um, we're going to follow this threefold path that was identified by uh, the early Christian mystics, following the version uh, that you find in the, the works of, of Dionysius, the Areopagite. We'll talk about him in just a minute. But I wanted to begin. Um, besides the preface that I just offered, I wanted to begin with um, an analogy, a comparison that um, occurred to me actually just, just in the last few days because I happened to be teaching this other material in one of my classes. Um, and I was talking about the, the life and work of the great Irish poet William Butler Yeats. And as some of you may be aware, Yeats lived a long and fruitful life, um, uh, which had many strange contours to it, which included a, a lifelong and passionate interest in esotericism, especially what at the time in the late 19th century into the early 20th century was called spiritualism. He was really interested in, in seances, communicating with the spirit world, and so forth. And he was, let's just say, somewhat unlucky in love for, um, for, for a good long part of his life. He was, he was besotted in his love for this legendary, this legendary stage actress, Maud Gone. She was, she was incredibly beautiful. She was fiery. Uh, she was unbelievably talented, and you know he was he was like putty in her putty in her hands. And she she would she withheld her love, and sometimes she gave it. Sometimes she would withhold it. Anyways, it was complicated. Um, and and uh, she, she, uh, she at one point she gave him the line, "We can't be we can't we can't be united as lovers because we're more like brother brother and sister." And it was, Fortunately, it led to some incredible poetry. <laughs> the, the, the lovelorn heart, it's, it's good for poetry. Um, so he, after Yeats turned 50, and he had produced all this incredible work, he was one of the most important poets of his time writing in English at this point. 
and this would have been 1915, he, he, met this, uh, he met this woman named George Hyde Lees. She uh, went by Georgie, and um, she was quite a bit younger than he was, and part of this sort of magical, mystical circle that he participated in. And she, um, to his great delight, uh, they went on their honeymoon, and she demonstrated she had this incredible proficiency with automatic writing. So that's the, that's the practice in which a person takes on a medium-like, uh, enters a medium-like trance, and then just begins to uh, speak on behalf of the spirit world through, through the pen or pencil. And she was incredibly skilled at this. And Yeats couldn't believe his good fortune. Like he had a direct line to the spirit world. And he began to interrogate the spirits. He called them the informants. And he would, um, he actually, because he was still really in love with Maud Gone, and he had d- developed an intense relationship with Maud's daughter, uh, Isolt. And he would say, should I pursue Isolt? Like he's w- married to George, and he's asking the spirits, and George is the medium. And to the credit of George and the spirits, they said, no, you really needed more rest. It would be good if you uh, got some more sleep and, and ate better. Uh, but this is, this is, the, this is the, the point of comparison I wanted to share with you. So when he first started to communicate with the spirit world through his new wife, George, he wanted, he wanted a complete explanation of the spirit world. And they responded to him, no, we have come to give you metaphors for poetry. Think about how cunning George Hyde Lees was to, to understand this is what she had to give to this. And at this point, I mean, he was, to repeat myself, among the, the, the most accomplished poets of his time, but he had yet to write his greatest work. He spent the last 25 years of his life essentially excavating all the material that he, he um, uncovered in this, in this encounter through George with the spirit world. No, we have come to give you metaphors for poetry. That's exactly how I feel about my encounter with this Christian mystical material at the time that I encountered it. I I truly feel like the Holy Spirit was saying, no, I have come to give you metaphors for poetry. And that's the way that I approach the material. It's it's incredibly rich. It is non-rational. It does not align with our desire to explain or understand it in the usual ways that we process things rationally, but rather it gives us access to the kinds of things that I believe we imagine when we're thinking about poetry. One of the things that poetry does, I think one of its principal powers, is it's capable of snipping the thread of logic that holds things together, or we believe things require in order to be held together. That snipping of the thread of logic is the thing that allows us to explode into or dissolve into this kind of larger form of consciousness. So I wanted to present that as a comparison or at least to give you a sense of how I orient to this material. I find it abundantly creative, endlessly resourceful. I don't claim to have any kind of understanding, perfect or imperfect, of the material, but it has... Uh, sustained me, it thrills me, um, and, and I'm, I'm really grateful to be able to share, share it with you. All right. So I have, uh, I have a little script here to follow, which I'm going to. So thus beginneth the, uh, thus beginneth the actual lecture. Um, oh, and just, just for your interest, I plan for this to go maybe 40 minutes or so, maybe a little bit, uh, it's in that vicinity, and then we'll have time for people who need to depart to, to, to depart without any um, feeling of commotion. And then those who want to stay and ask questions and chat for a little bit more, we'll do that for you know maybe another 20 to 30 minutes, OK? So that's the plan. And, and uh, if you're anxious about time, you can look above Father Bob. There's a clock. It telleth the time. All right. 
So, the classic, the classic formation of the threefold way to mystic union with God was first formulated by an unknown figure who called himself Dionysius the Areopagite. There he is. Okay. After a person who appears in the 17th chapter of Acts, he was most likely a Syrian monk who lived in the early 6th century. Dionysius taught through his coinage of the word hierarchy that the universe consists of a sacred order, a state of understanding, and an activity approximating as closely as possible to the divine. So that word hierarchy is one of uh, Dionysius's coinages. It means the rule of the sacred, the rule of, the rule of, of holiness. Okay? <clears throat> By envisioning this hierarchy, the soul is brought back to union with the hidden divinity. This process of vision, according to Dionysius, involves three stages. First, purification. That's going to be the topic of this evening's lecture. Um, or purgation. Sometimes it's called purgation. And the Greek word for uh, purification is the word catharsis, which was taken up by psychoanalysis to talk about anything that, anything that causes you to sort of release your emotions and feelings. Um, so purification or purgation, which is uh, when the soul is cleansed of its stains. The second is illumination. That'll be next week's lecture. And illumination is theoria. And we get the word theory from it. Um, and this is uh, what happens when the soul gazes upon the dazzling darkness of the divine. And then third, there's union. And the Greek word for union is henosis. Uh, technically, it means, it means um, the process of one-ment. The process of one becoming one. So, hen is the Greek for one, and osis is process. So, it's the process of oneing. I don't know. I feel like these, one of the great things about theology is it, it, it like poetry, it's permitted to make up words in order to, I mean, hierarchy. Think about it. Like, he made this up. He was like, I've got to come up with a word for the angels. I know. Hierarchy. It's a great word. So, henosis or Union is uh, when the soul is absorbed into the wholeness of God. So that's kind of our, that's our basic frame. So we begin with, we begin with uh, purification. Um, and as a way of getting a feel for this journey, for what's involved, consider this statement from the opening of the mystical theology, uh, Dionysius' masterpiece. He writes in the third paragraph. It's very short. The mystical theology has five chapters. It's about eight paragraphs long, and it will take a lifetime to read. You just, it's so, it's, it's, it's thick like peanut butter. It's really, really good. Nevertheless, Moses, who is the archetypal figure for encountering the mystery of God. So that's me just telling you how Dionysius is oriented toward Moses. They're all obsessed with Moses as this guiding figure for them. Mo Nevertheless, Moses did not attain to the presence of God himself. He saw not him, for he cannot be looked upon, but the place where he dwells. And this I take to signify that the divinest and highest things seen by the eyes or contemplated by the mind are but the symbolical expressions of those that are immediately beneath him who is above all. Through these, his incomprehensible presence is manifested upon those heights of his holy places. But then Moses breaks forth, even from that which is seen and that which sees, and he plunges into the truly mystical darkness of unknown from which all perfection of understanding is excluded. And he is wrapped up on that which is altogether intangible and intelligible, being wholly absorbed in him who is beyond all. Here, being neither oneself nor another, one is supremely united to the wholly unknown by the inactivity of all his reasoning powers, and thus, by knowing nothing, 
knows beyond the mind. Ooh. Yeah, put that in your pipe and smoke it. Okay, so a few, uh, that's by way of a kind of, uh, that's an appetizer. Uh, that should, should whet your appetite. So two preliminaries, okay? <clears throat> First, mysticism is generally understood to be ideas and experience that relate to a union with the divine. And from the outset here, let's state that while mystical experience tends to be favored as a way of understanding mysticism, it's impossible to separate its ideas, its theoria or illumination, from its experience. Mysticism is clearly a part of Christianity, therefore a context for understanding the religion. So even if you don't feel mystically inclined or you feel like you don't have a mystical bone in your body, encountering this material is indubitably a way to engage with Christianity as a whole, or, you know, parts of it. Mysticism is a process or a way of life, therefore something experienced, so there is a real experiential core to it, and mysticism is an attempt to express a direct consciousness of the presence of God. Therefore, it's a language, it's a grammar, it's an expressive intellectual medium. I like to think about it as a language. I like to think about it functioning like a language. That's in part why uh, I wanted to give you the, the, the metaphors for poetry analogy. It's like that. And, and that's just a way of saying, you don't have to be, uh, you know, you don't have to be a, a monastic in your cell, depriving yourself of one thing or another and aspiring towards mystical union with the divine. You just have to be somebody interested in, engaged in, and allowing yourself to receive unusual language. Like that's a way to generate a mystical experience of scripture, of yourself, of your situation. All right, how does, how, how does that, uh, wh where does that take us? It's gonna take us to the great William James. There's his years. Uh, psychologist William James, in his masterpiece, The Varieties of Religious Experience, reinforces the conviction that mysticism involves both personal religious experience and the expansion of religious consciousness, defining four states of the mystical. First, ineffability, which means that it defies expression, although those who experience a mystical state of consciousness may feel compelled to try to express it, and e you might even say even copiously. So there's a lot of mystical writing which consists of, you know, paragraphs and pages and books full of the mystic saying, I can't quite explain what happened to me, but let me try. <laughs> Second, it has a noetic quality. This comes from the Greek word nous, which is uh, the word for mind. <clears throat> it has a noetic quality, which means that it happens in the imagination, experienced powerfully as a state of knowledge. Sometimes what this can come across as is the noetic element is that it's, it's all in your head. It's no, it's, I want to stress, it's in your imagination. And your imagination consists of your entire person. It, it might be focused in an intellectual way. It might be focused in a, in a way that you think of as belonging to your, your mental processes or consciousness as we locate it in our, our minds. But you, the imagination involves, it involves everything. It involves all of you, your whole self. Third, it's transiency, which means in James's word, words that mystical states cannot be sustained for long. Uh, uh, somewhat hilariously to me, he indicates that most mystical states of consciousness last for an hour, sometimes two. I like that. Oh uh, yeah, it's like an hour. You can have that mystical state for an hour. That seems like gold. That's a, that's a golden hour. You know, I think most of us are looking for like 30 seconds, you know, just give me a little taste. And he's like, yeah, they last for an hour, sometimes two. It's like, wow, that's great. As the experience fades, while it may dissolve in its details, it deepens in its richness. 
And I really want to emphasize that as well. You don't, it's not like you have a mystical experience, transient experience, and you think, oh, I got it. I got it all. It's going to dissolve, but it's also going to deepen. And in the depth will resound meaning for you. And then fourth, it's passivity. That's the fourth of the features, which means that even as you might prepare the way for mystical experience and consciousness, like let's say you're a devoted, you know, a devoted uh, religious seeker, um, it is something that happens to you. It comes upon you. So uh, there's, there's uh, the, the word I like to think of in relation to this is receptivity. It's not that you can't do anything about it and it just happens to you. You have to open yourself up. You have to be receptive. Um, and in that state of receptivity, you're attuned. It can enter into you. Uh, at, at, towards the end of, of the preface to the 1855 Leaves of Grass, Walt Whitman wrote, uh, in order for there to be great poets, there must be great audiences. What he's talking about is receptivity. Like, you can't just do this stuff in a void. And the, there's a relational potency that's happening between you and the divine. So you're receiving it. You're, you're receiving that gift. Okay, these James calls the mystical group. And with these four traits, along with the conviction that mysticism is an attempt to express a direct consciousness of the presence of God, let's move forward. Ah, but first, one more thing from James. You're going to like this. Here's his, uh, this comes from the varieties of, of religious experience. And this is one of his statements about consciousness. Our normal waking consciousness, rational consciousness as we call it, is but one special type of consciousness, whilst all about it, parted from it by the filmiest of screens, there lie potential forms of consciousness entirely different. Now, if I tell you that he wrote this sentence in relation to all of the nitrous oxide that he was experimenting with, I was hoping you wouldn't laugh, but... Yeah, he just, he, it, 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 it loosened up his sense of consciousness and he realized the consciousness that, I, that I, I understand as normal, the consciousness that I prioritize as being my, my waking reality, actually maybe that's, not, maybe that's not it at all. Maybe that's just one of several modes. I, and I love, that, uh, I love that phrase there, filmiest of screens. Filmiest of screens, isn't that nice? Yes, it is. All right, back to Dionysius the Areopagite. So what we're going to do is look at four, we're going to look at uh, four mystics. We'll talk a little bit about their lives, and then we'll look, we'll, we'll look at and listen to uh, some of their works. And the four we're going to look at in this evening's talk are Dionysius the Areopagite. We're going to look at, um, oh, I should just look ahead. Uh, on my little, yeah. Uh, we're going to look at the cloud author. It's a, it's a, I'll explain who that is. Meister Eckhart, and then finally Marguerite of Poiret. So those will be the four for this evening. And like I said, I'll give you a taste of all of their, their contexts and their life stories here. You'll notice there's two different, uh, these are orthodox icons of Dionysius. Uh, he's considered a, a He's considered a foundational figure. Um, <clears throat> and as I suggested earlier, he's named after the figure who appears in the 17th chapter of Acts. And for many, uh, for, for many years, for, for, for centuries, the writings attributed to him were believed to be the, those of this authentic uh, New Testament figure. Um, eventually, scholars, um, and readers, among them Martin Luther, uh, who had knowledge of Greek and could tell that the grammar didn't match up with the grammar in the New Testament, uh, suggested that, in fact, this figure was, was somebody who lived later than that, in the, in the fifth or sixth century, um, probably in Syria, probably a monk. And, um, and from that point forward, uh, he began to be referred to as, um, as pseudo-Dionysius. And in fact, 
uh, that remains a, a prevalent scholarly way that he's referred to. The, the collection of his, his writings in English is through this amazing uh, series, The Classics of Western Spirituality, published by Paulus Press. It, it says Pseudo Dionysius on the, on the cover. So it, 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 tends to, it tends to prevail. However, um, going back to Bernard McGinn, I'm following his, his, his decision to refer to the figure simply as Dionysius. Because um, the pseudo has a quality of slightly diminishing him. I don't know. There's nothing pseudo about this fellow. Look at that icon. That's a serious, that's a serious figure. All right. While it did not originate with him, uh, or originate in him, apophatic or negative theology, <clears throat> apophatic. Well, there's a lot of fancy vocabulary here. Apophatic, the, uh, apophatic or negative theology found its keenest expression in Dionysius' writings. So apophatic theology emphasizes the fact that God is utterly unknowable and no human language can express anything true about the divine. The word comes from apo, meaning other than, and phenaean, meaning to speak. So apophasis, which is the, the noun that we can use from this adjective, apophasis. <clears throat> apophasis means then denial. So this is a strategy of approaching the divine through denying the attributes of the divine. But it also is a way of denying the desire to merely deny. You want, it's, 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 it's actually a way of opening in order to go beyond negative theology or apophatic theology. So Dionysius' thought was exceptionally influenced by the mysticism of Plotinus, a Neoplatonic mystic and philosopher living in Alexandria in the third century. You can see Plotinus' years there who envisioned that the divine, or the one, in an act of self-creation, emanates, or processes, or irradiates, and as the Godhead processes, in the sense of procession, that's why I'm pronouncing the word somewhat strangely, I don't mean processes, right? It processes, okay? As the Godhead processes, its self-pent thought or vision lavishly differentiates, energetically spreading and changing through creation. Plotinus calls this differentiation the intellectual principle, which is up there, expressing its complexity, plurality, and multiplicity as it showers through creation. So initially, there is this emanation, this irradiation, and then as that happens, as that, as that wave or that process expands, it begins to differentiate. The differentiation is, is almost like a natural, it's a natural product of this wave formation. <clears throat> and it showers through creation until it arrives at the all soul or universal soul whose sparks reside in our imaginations, compelling us to return in thought to the one in an act called reversion to source. I'm using the, uh, th th these are translations of these terms from Greek into, into English. Um, reversion to source is actually the word epistrophe or epistrophe if you want to. And some of you may be familiar, I hope you are, with the great uh, piano composition by Thelonious Monk of the same name. If there were a, a truly Plotinian figure in American jazz, it was the great Thelonious Monk. So saith I. Yeah, go, go to YouTube and, and, and test it out later. It's just, if, you don't, if you're not familiar with the tune, you, you might be, you'd be surprised because it's a great tune. And he would, always, uh, he would always finish his sets with it. 
So it's like reverting to source. I love it. Plotinus's imagination saturates Dionysius's. Dionysius's works include the divine names, which accounts for the procession from the divine source, the celestial hierarchy and the ecclesiastical hierarchy, which accounts for the differentiation of the divine energy in creation, and the mystical theology, the crucial work of negative theology, which accounts for the reversion to source. That mysterious paragraph I began with, uh, with all the strange terminology. It's a classic reversion to, to source that came from the mystical theology. To visualize and understand this threefold process, Dionysius coined two ingenious words. I'm going to erase these others here. <clears throat> he enjoyed, he uh, uh, coined two ingenious words. And the first is thearchy. It's kind of a shame this one didn't catch on. It's his word for the triune God who communi communicates himself in creation. Effectively, it's a synonym for the, the Holy Trinity. Thearchy. Arkos means rule. The, the the is theos, so it's it's the the rule of God, whereas hierarchy is the rule of the rule of the sacred or the rule of the holy. <clears throat> the second is hierarchy, and to repeat the definition I gave you earlier, it's a multiple yet ordered manifestation of the divine source. And I'm getting both of those definitions from Bernard McGinn, so I'll attribute my source. I, I, I'm, I'm happy to attribute uh, the definitions to that source. So Dionysius's celestial, oh, there's, there's the terms if you're, you're curious. Okay, I'll leave that up for a, a few minutes if you want to jot it down. Dionysius's celestial hierarchy is perhaps the most vivid flowering forth of angelic spirituality in Christian history. As influential in its depiction of the supernatural realms of heavenly messengers, as the apophatic theology in the mystical theology has been on subsequent expressions of the nature of the divine. So Dionysius envisions nine orders of angels clustered in three triads. Here's a depiction of uh, the assumption of the version, but there are all of those hierarchies of angels ringed around. So here are the nine orders of angels clustered in three triads, from lowest to highest. So we're actually going to start over in the bottom, uh, the bottom right, okay? We're going to thread our way up back towards seraphim. I, I, seraphim are at the top, but we're going to start at the, at the angels, just so you can climb the ladder yourself. So the lowest order are the angels, who are the revelation to the world. Archangels, who are the interpreters of divine enlightenment, and principalities who manifest transcendent principles to all orders, angelic and human. So that's the first triad. The second triad begins with the lower, the lower third authorities who lift up lower ranks into divinity, powers who manifest courage in divine activity, and then dominions who are disinclined to tyrannical dissimilarities, I like that phrase, who promote benevolent rule and who freely lift other powers up. I, I too am disinclined to tyrannical dissimilarities. Maybe in that respect I'm like a dominion. And then that's the second triad and then the first triad, so it's the third triad, second triad, the first triad, thrones who are forever in the divine presence, cherubim, made of flame, who possess the power to know and see divinity, and then the seraphim, made of light, and who circle perennially around God. And you get a little bit of that. If we go back, you can see there's the sense of the ascending order and the... Yeah, question. Uh, in the sense that they're created beings, yes. Yeah, it's a funny word. It appears in the it appears in the New Testament, thronos or thronoi, 
and it, it's just, it, it, refers to a, it refers to a celestial being. But we, in English, use that word to refer to a chair. It's, it's different. It, it's just, it just happens to be the same word. Yeah. Whereas we're aware of cherubim and seraphim. I mean, we hear that. But we think of cherubs as like the little pooty, the little naked babies with the wings. And they're great. But the, I mean, I do. I, who doesn't love those? Uh, but but the, the, the cherubim are, these are the, the angels of flame, scissoring flame, and they are the ones placed uh, at, at the gates uh, into the Garden of Eden. Like they're, the, they're whirling their flaming swords, preventing any, any soul from, any person from re-entering. Yeah, so these are like terrifying, these are terrifying beings. Yeah, but they are beings. They're cre- they are created. Okay, for Dionysius, the angels are theophanies or illuminations of divine attributes. And what they reveal are the energies in whom and through whom God is ceaselessly manifested in creation. In terms of visionary Christianity, the celestial hierarchy has no equal in its influence in art and poetry, except perhaps the transfiguration. Some of you know how how much I dig the transfiguration. I I also dig the celestial hierarchy. In terms of Christian mystical theology, Dionysius' negative theology, which we're going to get to, uh, we're going to get to in part uh, in in next week's lecture and also some some more in the lecture after Thanksgiving. Um, Dionysius' negative theology, uh, which performs the function of catharsis, oh, I erased it already, Uh, in which the soul is cleansed of its stains, has exerted radical influence. If the celestial hierarchy permits us to visualize the differentiating energy of God's creation, Dionysius' negative theology enables us to begin the mysterious and often arduous reversion to source, shedding our visualizations and understandings in the movement towards total union with God. So, mouthful, but let's look now at Dionysius' influence on three striking figures in the Western Christian mystical tradition. So, first, we have the cloud author. Be a great name as an author, wouldn't it? Like, yeah, I'm the cloud author. I love it. The cloud author was most likely a Carthusian priest who wrote in the late 14th century a spiritual masterpiece called The Cloud of Unknowing. Uh, also, not coincidentally, the cloud author was the person to translate Dionysius into Middle English. And the word, the name that they gave to Dionysius was, uh, was Dennis. So in English, Dennis is a version of, uh, any version like, I mean, there are other Dennises, or, or Denise. Those are versions of, of Dionysius, okay? Uh, and I, one of my favorite, uh, I love, I love the, the title that the cloud author used for the mystical theology. That word mystical and that word theology, they didn't exist in Middle English when the cloud author was writing. So uh, his, his, uh, the cloud author's name for the mystical th- theology is, it's, uh, uh, it's Dennis, which includes the possessive, uh, or sometimes it's 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 Dionys, um, and then the name of the thing is Hid Divinity. Hid was as close as as the author could get to mystical. It's good, and I like the spelling of divinity. It looks like dynamite, because that's what it's like encountering the divine. Uh, that's actually a page from the manuscript. So um, that's, that's, that's Dionysus. That, I'm sorry, that's the cloud author's writing. All right. So he wrote this masterpiece called The Cloud of Unknowing, which was written as an instruction manual for a young contemplative apprentice. As a result, its tone is gentle and generous, coaxing the young monk to seek the unknowable God through love, specifically the sharp dart of longing love. I recommend this text to you. Um, 
unequivocally. It's really just beautiful and, like I said, very tenderly written. And I want to give you, um, I want to give you a taste, which is uh, chapter six from the Cloud of Unknowing, which is um, has a title: A Short Explanation of Contemplation in the Form of a Dialogue. Now, this is the Cloud author writing to his apprentice. Now. Now you say, how shall I proceed to think of God as he is in himself? To this, I can only reply, I do not know. With this question, you bring me into the very darkness and cloud of unknowing that I want you to enter. Through grace, a man may know completely and ponder thoroughly every created thing in its works. Yes, and God's works too, but not God himself. Thought cannot comprehend God, and so... I prefer to abandon all I can know, choosing rather to love him whom I cannot know. Though we cannot know him, we can love him. By love, he may be touched and embraced, never by thought. Of course, we do well at times to ponder God's majesty or kindness for the insight these meditations may bring. But in the real contemplative work, you must set all this aside and cover it over with a cloud of forgetting. Then let your loving desire, gracious and devout, step bravely and joyfully beyond it and reach out to pierce the darkness above. Yes, beat upon that thick cloud of unknowing with the dart of your loving desire and do not cease come what may. It's good, and that's at the beginning of it. Like, think about what's kind of come after that. It's so, it's such a beautiful text. And the cloud author is, you know, he's besotted with Dionysius's mystical vision of, of reality. And this text has exerted a really, uh, you know, an impressive influence, not just in, in terms of Christian mystical literature, but also uh, in terms of English language literature. Because again, to go back to my initial analogy, it's this it's just this incredible metaphor, cloud of unknowing. You don't, uh, you don't quite know what it means. In the words of the cloud author, I don't know. You don't quite know what it means, but it works in you in this way. And then to compare it to this cloud of forgetting, which is somehow different, it's intriguing. Okay, next. Meister Eckhart. <clears throat> Uh, so Eckhart lived from sometime around the year 1270 to 1328, and he was a Dominican preacher. His mysticism was profoundly scriptural, arising from the discipline of biblical commentary. That is to say, he gave sermons and he, he wrote what we would think of as little essays, homilies essentially, and they are fundamentally related to scripture. He would read scripture and from the act of interpretation, he would pry it open and he would start to see all kinds of unfathomable things in scripture. Eckert believed that God overflows into creation in a way so excessively that an inexhaustible interiority accessed through interpretation of religious texts in its saturation would yield to a transformative breakthrough in which a person might recreate the meaning of the text from the perspective of a union between the person and God. Yeah, it's kind of heavy. In scripture he claimed, there it is more inward than it can be to itself. I've been pondering that for a couple of decades. I have no idea what it means but it thrills me every time I encounter it. There it can be, I'm sorry, there it is more inward than it can be to itself. That's like uh, visualizing four dimensions, you know? He insisted further of God that his breaking through is nobler than his flowing out. And this is a kind of Dionysian paradigm, which is to say, there's the emanation, there's the, there, there's, there's the flowing out, and that is essential. It's, 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 it's constructive. It gives us something to do. But breaking through is nobler. 
There's the first act, the flowing out, but then when we come back, the breaking through. Nobler. One of Eckhart's most vivid conceptualizations involves the aspiration toward true poverty in which you want nothing, you know nothing, and you have nothing, moving towards the inner poverty of the annihilation of the will to lead you back to the foretime of creation and then beyond into union with God. Poverty is a condition that prefigures a form of unknowing. Um, you can see here at the bottom, I've indicated that in 1329, shortly after Eckhart himself died, he was officially declared a heretic by Pope John the 22nd. They went through his writings and they found, I want to say it's 13 articles, but in any case, they came up with these, you know, a dozen or so points in his writings that, that the church just could not tolerate. Um, and he was regarded as a heretic for, you know, many years, centuries, you could even say. Uh, but he has been long beloved by, by people interested in the mystical tradition in the Western, the West, the Western church, so-called Western church. And furthermore, he's, he's similarly beloved by philosophers, artists, other kinds of thinkers, simply because he had such dexterity with language and metaphor. He wrote in German and in Latin, um, but even there, one of his coinages, which I love, is the word uh, ebolitio, which is his word for the, the, the overboiling of God. So one way to put it is, Creation is God overboiled. You can think of a big pot of water with, you know, before you're going to toss the pasta in, and all of a sudden, ugh, it overboils. That's the Eckhart vision of creation. It's really potent. <clears throat> so, uh, I'm going to read for you um, a little selection here. Um, it's about the same length as the the cloud passage I just read. And this comes from, um, this comes from his 52nd sermon. A great master says that his breaking through is nobler than his flowing out. And this is true. When I flowed forth from God, all creatures declared there is a God. But this cannot make me blessed for with this, no with this I acknowledge myself as a creature. But in my breaking through, where I stand free of my own will, of God's will, of all his works, and of God himself, then I am above all creatures and am neither God nor creature. But I am that which I was and shall remain forevermore. There I shall receive an imprint that will raise me above all the angels. By this imprint I shall gain such wealth that I shall not be content with God inasmuch as he is God, or with all his divine works, for this breaking through guarantees to me that I and God are one. Then I am what I was. Then I neither wax nor wane, for then I am an unmoved cause that moves all things. Here God finds no place in man, for man by his poverty wins for himself what he has eternally been and shall eternally remain. Here God is one with the Spirit, and that is the strictest poverty one can find. From his 52nd sermon, which is called the Poverty Sermon, um, and, and sort of comes to that rouse. That's almost the end of it, comes to that rousing conclusion. <clears throat> okay, finally, there's Marguerite of Porette, who died in 1310. She was, where she was burned at the stake in Paris. Um, as a heretic, after she refused to stop circulating her book, The Mirror of Simple Souls, or The Mirror of Annihilated Souls, both titles. Marguerite was condemned as a free spirit, someone whose teachings suggested that because she had attained a quality of union with God, she was effectively free from the rules and obligations that might otherwise constrain her, her spiritually. Uh, sometimes 
the, the free, free spirits were also called quietists. Quietism. It's uh, essentially what I just described as the free spirit. Someone who claims to attain union with God and for whom, therefore, the, was effectively free of the rules. <clears throat> you can guess where this is going. Free of the rules. So, Porette Marguerite was a Beguin, uh, which was a, a, a religious fellowship. That's probably the best word for it. With a status between laity and clergy. The Beguines modeled their rule on monastic orders, but they were also free to preach in an itinerant manner and even to marry. Um, and they were mostly women, mostly women. And their activities were looked upon with great suspicion by the church authorities. Uh, you won't be surprised to hear, they were popular. <clears throat> the mirror centers on a deeply apophatic form of mysticism involving the annihilation of the created will through the power of totally disinterested love. It consists of passionate and often self-canceling dialogues between reason and Lady Love. Those are the two main characters. Whose for and Lady Love's force is annihilating. As well as poetry and hymns. The tone throughout is rapturous. The union with God towards which the book works is both ravaging and euphoric. Lady Love instructs reason that it must work to disencumber the soul of the person from her will which happens through several mysterious agents whom she sometimes names God, sometimes far near, which is one of her names for the Trinity. Isn't that great? That's, all, that's almost as good as thearchy. Far near. <clears throat> and sometimes the Trinity itself. And Lady Love insists that the understanding of the annihilated soul exceeds scripture human sense, and all human works. So, I'm going to finish here with a passage from The Mirror of Simple Souls, or The Mirror of Annihilated Souls, give you a taste of Marguerite's work. All of these, all three of these figures coming after Dionysius are exemplars of this, at this negative way, this, this moving towards God through a kind of, um, it's, it's a, it's a, a play of language that's also uh, something very serious. So, here's, here's Marguerite. Given by the Most High, in whom this creature is ravished by the fullness of understanding and becomes nothing in her understanding, and such a soul who has become nothing has everything, wills nothing and wills everything, knows nothing and knows everything. And how can that be? Lady love, says reason, that this soul can will what this book says, which has already said earlier that she has no will. Reason, says love, it is not her will that wills it, but the will of God who wills it in her. For this soul does not remain within love, which makes her will, which makes her will it by some desire. Love remains in her who has taken her will, and thus love does her will with her, and love works in her without her. Let's just take a moment and thank Peter. Oh. Thank you. My pleasure.